20th century, the Great Depression, two world wars, totalitarian states, the Chernobyl disaster, everything at the edge of a nuclear war. A pretty tough time to laugh, isn't it? Yeah. But we can notice that even during those no doubt calamitous times, there were numerous attempts to make some sense of the increasingly more crazy world with the help of humor. Take Coppola's Apocalypse Now that makes an astonishing discovery that American democracy smells about the same as napalm. Smells like... Victory. But you may wonder, how is it possible to laugh at such serious matters as wars where thousands of people die? I mean, the society would surely think of you as immoral. Isn't it very similar to Theodore Adorno's statement about the barbarity of writing poetry after Auschwitz and after the many horrors of war? Isn't laughter also barbaric and immoral according to that logic? Well, maybe, but it seems like laughter doesn't really care, because in a way, laughter is immoral. Henri Bergson was writing in one of his essays that laughter is only possible if you reduce to the minimum your emotions and empathy towards the object that is laughed at and at its context. He was writing of the momentary anesthesia of the heart at the time of laughter. And that makes a ton of sense, because when we laugh, we cannot really consider all of the gloomy details of life and uh, the object laughed at, because then we would feel pity towards it, and we can't really laugh at something we pity. Uh, let's take as an example this video where a cat has a deadly fight with a boa constrictor. It may seem funny until you realize that the whole species of cats has been oppressed by boa constrictors for centuries, making this species endangered, and that this particular cat most likely has a major feline depressive disorder that can cause its spine getting overheated as a result of a thermonuclear chemical reaction that can make the whole planet blow up in half a second. So instead, we just gotta chill out and watch the video with a kitty. Only then it's funny. Okay, now we've found out that laughter makes you unempathetic, but especially in the 20th century literature, we can also feel that this unempathetic laughter is often kinda wrong. We as readers don't really laugh ourselves, it doesn't feel funny any longer. And that happens for numerous reasons and in different manners, which we're going to explore based on the novels by Kurt Vonnegut, Milan Kundera and Flan O'Brien. This video is a continuation of our series of videos on the history of laughter in literature, so if you haven't seen the previous video, check it out as well, though you can absolutely watch this one separately. So now let's get started with the deadliest war on Earth and how it changed the human timeline. Billy was preposterous, six feet and three inches tall, with a chest and shoulders like a box of kitchen matches. He had no helmet, no overcoat, no weapon and no boots. He didn't look like a soldier at all, he looked like a filthy flamingo. This is the description of Billy Pilgrim, an American young man who has been drafted to the United States Army during World War II, and the main character of Kurt Vonnegut's novel Slaughterhouse Five. As you can see from his description, Billy is literally a joke. He's not really suited to be at war with his skinny composition and sore feet, but the war still had to be fought, so they sent Billy to fight it. He didn't last long as a warrior and soon was promoted to a prisoner of war in a German camp, though still being a filthy flamingo, probably. Later on, Billy lives through one of the most disastrous events of the war, bombing of Dresden. He has to hide in a meat locker underground, the Slaughterhouse 5, where he has a sudden revelation, he is unstuck in time. This means that he realized that time is an illusion, it doesn't have to always flow in one direction, but kind of happens simultaneously. It allows Billy to constantly jump in time from being a prisoner of war to his childhood, or 
to the time when he is kidnapped by some strange creatures from the planet called Trophamador, who accidentally also share his belief in simultaneous time. For example, they don't see the stars as shiny points hanging in the sky, but rather see where each of them has been and where each of them will ever be. So for the Trophamadorians, the sky is not filled with dots, but rather with luminous spaghetti of the paths the stars travel during their lifetime. And it works in the same manner with basically everything in the universe, which has an interesting implication because the Trophamadorians believe that everything in the universe has been predetermined from the very beginning, so they don't talk about free will or liberty because it just doesn't make sense to them. So the only thing you can really do in their opinion is grab a beer, sit back and contemplate the universe. However, when you are reading this book you can notice that the humor in it is a bit strange, which is because Vonnegut often uses black humor combined with irony in his books. Uh, take the example of the slaughterhouse where Billy hides from the bombing. In the normal time of peace, the slaughterhouse is the place of most killing. But the irony of war turns it upside down and now the slaughterhouse is one of the safest places in the city, because it has underground floors. Besides this dark irony, a specific feature of Vonnegut's humor is that it often borders on the edge of not being humor at all. Often we are really wondering if he means what he writes about or he's just kidding. I like to call it ambivalent humor, and one of such ambivalences is the genre itself. Although it seems like this is clearly an anti-war novel, because it includes some pretty cruel details about the effect wars have on people, Vonnegut himself seems to be very skeptical of the idea that he can do anything to prevent wars with writing such books. In the opening chapter of the book, Vonnegut has a conversation with some filmmaker. He is asked, is it an anti-war book? Yes, I said, I guess. You know what I say to people when I hear they're writing anti-war books? No, what do you say, Harrison Starr? I say, why don't you write an anti-glacier book instead? What he meant, of course, was that there would always be wars and that they were as easy to stop as glaciers. I believe that too. So this makes us wonder if Vonnegut really did want his books to influence anything or if he was just totally kidding. Another example of this ambivalent humor is this idea of the inevitability of war. It seems like Vonnegut is pretty seriously discussing that there was practically no way to prevent that war or any war at all, because that's just what's in human nature and that's what's destined to happen. However, after reading a few of Vonnegut's other books, you can notice how he often makes ironic statements in such cases, using something that we can call othering. It means that he often creates a group of creatures that seems different from normal people, but actually serves as an exaggeration of the people. So in the case of the Slaughterhouse Five, it's the Drophomadorians who seem to be very different from humans because they are toilet plungers with a hand on top, but their worldview on the inevitability of everything actually mirrors the attitudes of real people towards the war. Vonnegut specifically makes it obvious in the book how the Germans, just as the Trollfermadorians, were also thinking of the war as something that couldn't be prevented, it just had to happen. In another book, Cat's Cradle, Vonnegut makes up a whole religion, Bocanonism, which actually makes statements that are similar to those of the Trollfermadorians. One of the books of this religion is titled What Can a Thoughtful Man Hope for Mankind on Earth Given the Experience of the Past Million Years? Vonnegut writes, it doesn't take long to read the 14th book. It consists of one word and a period. This is it. Nothing. So, by creating a distinct other, Vonnegut manages to kinda make fun of humans without telling them it's about humans. Another interesting example of ambivalent humor is the whole topic of time in Slaughterhouse-Five. On the one hand, we might think that Billy just 
cracked up in the war and started seeing things, so no wonder he was kidnapped by toilet plungers and started traveling in time. But on the other hand, this whole thing about time can be seen as a dialogue with many other cultures and philosophical ideas. One such dialogue is with the previous times of crisis and with the books about them. An example of this is Romanticism and the French Revolution of the end of the 18th century. We can see that uh, in the literature of that era, time is also not acting as usual. It's extremely fast and dynamic, as you can see in Lord Byron's poems, such as Don Juan or Mazep or Charles Harrell's Pilgrimage. All those poems feature a character who is in constant movement, shooting like an arrow through the world. But even in those revolutionary times, narration was always flowing in one direction, though it was extremely fast. So when comparing fiction of the early 19th century and the war fiction of the 20th, something seems to have changed, which allowed for this shift towards nonlinear narration and time. Partly, it can be the influence of modernist novels such as Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, which also used nonlinear narration, but partly, I think, the reason for this is the scale of the 20th century war itself, and something that Tamara Hundrova, a Ukrainian literary critic, called the crisis of representation when discussing the literature after the Chernobyl disaster, but which also applies to the Second World War. She makes a point that in the case of the 20th century disasters, it's no longer possible to give an objective representation of the events, some linear step-by-step -step breakdown of what happened. That's because the scale of the events makes everyone perceive the disaster in their own unique way. So when you compare the testimonies of different people who lived through the same event, you'll find that the versions differ quite a lot. So if we take this idea of the crisis of representation, it's no wonder that someone like Billy Pilgrim could have started time traveling because that's their own personal response to the tragic event, which no longer can have an objective view on how things happened one after another. This also correlates with philosophic ideas of the 20th century, namely those of Henri Bergson, who was writing that the concept of time that we have adopted is fundamentally wrong, because it presupposes that time passes in a linear fashion, second after second. Instead, time as we humans perceive it exists simultaneously in our consciousness and does not at all match with the time of the clock. I'm sure you've all experienced it when a day passes too fast, you don't even remember what happened, or when time drags when you're waiting for something. Those are all examples of subjective time that doesn't go hand in hand with the clock, which surely also happened with Billy Pilgrim in Vonnegut's novel. And some similar views were stated in the scientific community. For example, Stephen Hawking was saying that there is basically no reason why time should always go forwards and not backwards. In one of the episodes in the novel, Billy imagines how the events of the bombing would have looked like in reverse. American planes full of holes and wounded men and corpses took off backwards from an airfield in England. The formation flew backwards over a German city that was in flames. The bombers opened their bomb bay doors, exerted a miraculous magnetism which shrunk the fires, gathered them into cylindrical steel containers and lifted the containers into the bellies of the planes. The containers were stored neatly in racks. When the bombers got back to their base, the steel cylinders were taken from the racks and shipped back to the United States of America, where factories were operating day and night, dismantling the cylinders, separating the dangerous contents into minerals. Touchingly, it was mainly women who did this work. The minerals were then shipped to specialists in remote areas. It was their business to put them into the ground to hide them cleverly so they would never hurt anybody ever again. Everybody turned into a baby and all humanity, without exception, conspired biologically to produce two perfect people called Adam and Eve. A good fairy tale didn't happen quite that way though. 
By the way, this episode is very similar to how Jonathan Safran Foer was describing the events of 9-11 in his novel. I have another video on that topic, so check it out as well. So from this obviously ironic episode, we can guess that Vonnegut is really skeptical of the idea of progress that makes humanity better with each year. After all, the Trophimidorians already know how the universe will end. It will be accidentally blown up by a test pilot while experimenting with a new type of fuel. And in the other novel with the Buchananism religion, everybody on Earth dies because of accidentally freezing all of the water on the planet. So yeah, Vonnegut seems to be pretty skeptical about things. However, the Book of Bokonan also says, don't be a fool, close this book at once, it is nothing but FOMA, or lies. So by the time you've read this line, you have absolutely no idea what Vonnegut means and when you're supposed to laugh or when you're supposed to cry. But at least you can try laughing, which is something prohibited by law in the country of our next humorist. Once again, the Soviet Union, demonstrating a colossal contempt for the opinion of mankind, has resorted to brute force to keep a satellite nation under control. Russian tanks and infantry, aided by troops from East Germany, Hungary, Poland, and Bulgaria, have occupied Czechoslovakia and have crushed the new and relatively liberal leadership of that small country. Maketa is living her best life in a Soviet Czechoslovakian camp with the Stalin's portrait in her room, love for the Communist Party and a few barrels of propaganda about the best future on earth. The young student Ludwig is outraged by this girl's optimism. He jokingly writes a message that says Optimism is the opium of the people. A healthy atmosphere stinks of stupidity. Long live Trotsky. Ludwig. That was a mistake. Besides pretending to be a follower of Trotsky, who was an enemy of the people in the Stalinist USSR, Ludwig has insulted the holiest of holies, one of the main pillars of the Soviet society, optimism. You might have been imagining the Soviet Union as a gloomy place with a never-ending winter and depressive brutalist buildings, but in fact, at least on paper, it was a highly optimistic country which was shining with a hope for a great future without capitalism and McDonald's. Ludwig, who is the main character of Milan Kundera's novel The Joke, is highly skeptical of this optimism because it smells like a pile of propaganda. So he makes his little joke on this optimism, which eventually gets him expelled from his university, from the Communist Party, and gets him basically to be a slave in the Soviet mines. What we can see here is a clash between two types of humor, the false collective optimism of the Soviet Union and the intellectual humor of an individual. The first one is always collective and depersonalized. It's always some pretty image that people are made to believe because it's needed for political reasons. The second type is its opposite. It isn't imposed from above because it comes from a particular individual as his reaction towards what's happening around. This one is often countercultural. Remember our previous video on laughter as counterculture. But what's also interesting about it is that it's often multifaceted and quite ambiguous, similar to how it is in Kurt Vonnegut's novels. A joke of this kind is both true and not true at the same time. On the one hand, when we make a joke, we don't mean it to be taken seriously. In English, there's even a phrase to take a joke, which means not taking it seriously and not getting offended. However, on the other hand, a joke very often is serious in the way that it really does mean what it says. You don't joke about something that's totally not true, right? And it is exactly this multifacetedness of a joke that drives a totalitarian state crazy. Ludwig from Kundera's novel is all about having multiple faces, which he speaks about in the following passage. Who was the real me? I can only repeat, I was a man of many faces. At meetings I was earnest, enthusiastic and committed. Among friends, unconstrained and given to teasing. With Marquetta, cynical and footfully witty. And alone, and thinking about Marquetta, unsure of myself and as agitated as a schoolboy. A person who has 
revealed that he has many faces, has no place in the totalitarian society, he is not reliable. And this total inability to take a joke in the USSR leads to an inversion of the joke, because when we are reading the novel, we are starting to see that the title is not so much about the joke by Ludwig, but a joke on Ludwig. It's a kind of a meta joke that refers to the joke itself and undermines it. At the end of the novel, Ludwig realizes how he has been trapped in a prison of history and from a subject of a joke, he became an object of it. What if history plays jokes? And then I realized how powerless I was to revoke my own joke when throughout my life as a whole I was involved in a joke much more vast, all-embracing for me and utterly irrevocable. So in this way Milan Kundera reveals how totalitarian structures of power relate to the concept of humor. This novel is actually about a lot more than that, it also discusses the problems of memory and folk tradition, which doesn't relate too much to our topic of the crisis of laughter, but feel free to read the book yourselves and find out more about it. In the meantime, we are passing to the last part of this video and to a novel that's set in a land of a lot of rain and a lot of gloomy self-irony. Bonaparte Okanasa is a newborn baby from a small village in Western Ireland. He is a rather doubtful fellow in all meanings of the word. Nobody really expected him to be born, neither his father, who almost got a stroke when he saw his son for the first time, nor his mother, who now had to boil three more potatoes for the new family member. In fact, the neighbors believed the boy to be born of another woman and not of his mother. The boy wanted to check that when he grew up a little, but the neighbors had all been dead by then. The trouble with Bonaparte, as well as with many other Irish people from his region, was that all of them are trapped inside a literary matrix. And not because all of them are characters in Flann O'Brien's novel The Poor Mouth, but because all of them have read too many books about true Irishness. Most of those books, such as The Island Man by Thomas O'Crowan, are about some olden times of Ireland when the grass was greener, potatoes were tastier, and most people spoke Gaelic. Though all that wasn't the case any longer, the people whom O'Brien describes in his novel still continue to live according to the same glorious modes of behavior of the past. For example, many of those books had the phrase a child among the ashes, which meant a child who had not yet learned to walk. But this metaphoric meaning is now lost for the characters in O'Brien's novel, which creates curious episodes when Bonaparte's granddad rebukes the child's mother for not letting the boy lay in the ashes. Well, said the old fellow, when I was a raw youngster growing up, I was, as is clear to any reader of the good Gaelic books, a child among the ashes. You have thrown all the ashes of the house back into the fire or swept them out of the yard, and not a bit left for the poor child on the floor, he pointed a finger towards me, to let him into. It's an unnatural and unregulated training and rearing he'll have here without any experience of the ashes. Therefore, woman, it's disrespectful for you not to leave the hub full of dirt and ashes just as the fire leaves it. And eventually the granddad gets exactly what he wanted, and the narrator boy tells, when everything was arranged, I moved over near the fire, and for five hours I became a child in the ashes, a raw youngster rising up according to the old Gaelic tradition. You may find it similar to our talk about Don Quixote in the previous video, but if Don Quixote was a single person who lost his mind, with the girls in the novel it's more like the mainstream. As Bonaparte notices on his first walk to school, many other children besides me were going to school that morning with a stain of the ashes still on the breeches of many of them. In another episode, Bonaparte mentions that his family lived in a small, lime-white, unhealthy house situated in a corner of the glen as you go eastwards along the road. Seems like nothing wrong with that, but then we find out that all of the people lived in the same kind of house. 
If there were a hundred corners in all that glen, there was a small lime-white cabin nestling in each one and no one knows who built any of them either. It has always been the destiny of the true gales, if the books be credible, to live in a small lime-white house in a corner of the glen as you go eastwards along the road. And all that is because if you want to be a true gale, you have to live in truly Gaelic houses, in truly Gaelic places and doing truly Gaelic activities activities like eating potatoes and singing folk songs. So all of those people seem to be stuck in a system of cliches that's been fixed in books and those cliches actually define their lives. Their thoughts are so far out of the real world that some of them have some absurd doubts about whether they are even humans. We're not horses nor hens, seals nor ghosts, and in spite of all that, it's unbelievable that we are humans. This inhuman feeling of the place and its people is further reinforced by the constant heavy rain people have to live with. At times, we are told, it's been raining for days on end, so the inhabitants of the place aren't sure anything's ever going to be dry again. And these are the times when you realize that these are not images of reality, but of surreality, of a distorted world for distorted people. And though you can't really stop the rain, O'Brien shows us that for the gales there is a really good alternative – stop being gales in the first place. Throughout the novel you can feel how the English imperialist culture is constantly pressing on the Irish-speaking population. In one of the episodes, the English government sends inspectors to Ireland to pay two pounds, quote, for every child of ours that speaks English instead of this thieving Gaelic. And when Irish children come to English language schools, all of them are given the name Jams O'Donnell. All of them become a standardized unit of the society, so that Bonaparte's name is Jams O'Donnell, his son's name would be Jams O'Donnell, and all the other sons' names would also be Jams O'Donnells. O'Brien is not too optimistic in terms of that, because just as Bonaparte's father comes out of prison, Bonaparte himself goes into prison, thus closing the cycle of Gaelic life, which oscillates between birth, imprisonment and death. And even though the main character says that he is happy to be safe in jail and free from the miseries of life, we feel that O'Brien's humor in this novel is pretty much hopeless. He doesn't want to give any false promises to his readers, like those other Gaelic novels his characters read. At this point we can remember James Joyce's quote from Ulysses that a symbol of Irish art is the cracked looking glass of a servant. Indeed, that seems to be an exact description of what O'Brien criticizes in Irish literary tradition. The unfortunately servile gales looking into the mirror where they can no longer see themselves because it is shattered.